Welcome to Local Lens. I'm Georgian Lucier, today's host, and I'm delighted to welcome back Matthew Bailey, who is a certified funeral services practitioner. He is the president of Connecticut Life Tributes, and he's a speaker and trainer, and we're going to delve into uh, more detail around some of the topics surrounding the services provided by the funeral industry, so welcome. Good, good to you. Thank you. Matthew. Let's talk about this life tribute celebrant that um, I was not familiar with mm-hmm. before we spoke, and I'm sure it's supported by many social trends. So what what is the role and what type of people tend to end up in those jobs that might be interested if they're listening in? Sure. Yeah, the lack of familiarity isn't um, unprecedented. A, a lot of people are that way, and, and they really, the concept in, in terms of funeral work came to the United States uh, a number of years ago, uh, a gentleman by the name of Doug Manning, who's done a lot of writing in uh, the areas of grief, uh, was doing some presenting in Australia. And everywhere he went, he kept uh, encountering these people who called themselves funeral celebrants. Okay. And finally said, you know, what what is this? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Australia was a little bit ahead of us in terms of some societal changes, particularly around the role of, of religion. Um, the The... You know, Anglican communion was, was, was big for a long time in Australia, but as time went on and the country began to grow in terms of being more secular, uh, people began to embrace what was known as funeral celebrants. Uh, and these are individuals who are trained to sit down with the family, uh, have a family meeting, collect the stories of a person's life, find mm-hmm. out those things that made them unique and special. Uh, and craft a totally custom, unique, and and personalized service. Uh, Sometimes these are spiritual, sometimes they're religious, sometimes they're none of the above, Um, but they're uh, they're always designed to to really be about the person that that passed away. Uh, The people in the United States and now around the world that we see that do this are uh, often people that are really interested in stories. They get excited about hearing about a person's life uh, there are people who typically are not afraid of public speaking or, or being in front of an audience or a crowd, and they just find great reward and uh, joy in, in helping celebrate a person's life. And where would someone find this life celebrant? Like in your organization, if they were to approach for services, would you be able to introduce them to the idea of it mm-hmm. as an option? Yeah, we work with uh, celebrants um, who who we refer families to. Mm-hmm. Um, at our funeral homes, it's actually a rule that you know every licensed funeral director that sits and works with families gets certified as a celebrant, okay. uh, even if they're not going to function in that role. And mm-hmm. some of them have no desire and never will function in that role. Okay. But uh, just the belief that it's important to understand how the concept works, uh, what the role of a celebrant is, what they do, um, to be able to help articulate that. Because a lot of times we have families that come in and sit down with us to make arrangements um, who know what they don't want more Mm -hmm. than they know what they do want. Um, And and they may say, I don't want a funeral that looked like what we did for my uncle Tony Mm -hmm. 15 years ago. And they may not know what their alternatives and their options are. So uh, that's where we as professionals have to come in and, and educate them and show them a, a variety of different options that, that are available. What does the training involve? So the training is uh, it's pretty comprehensive. It, it starts off with um, a review of the grieving process mm-hmm. and, and the needs that we have when we have uh, a loss in our lives. And then it ties into that the, the elements of ceremony and service and funeral and mm-hmm. the different parts of them that go into making um, a good funeral and addressing the needs of a family that's had a loss um, and just doing a real strong foundation about the value and the importance of, of why we have funerals. And then there's the technical aspects of it that come from uh, navigating a, a meeting with a family mm-hmm. and helping to you know, understand uh, the components that go into putting a service together, um, sharing different ideas for creative services and what, what that might look like. Um, doing some training around some of the challenges that that we face uh, with family dynamics mm-hmm. and um, you know difficult cases that come up uh, that some people might want to avoid. Uh, not every death is easy and clean. So sometimes I would imagine many are not. Yeah. So mm-hmm. if if there's death, um, 
as a result of violence, if um, suicide, addiction, there's all sorts of things that come into play that sometimes people want to dance around or try mm -hmm. to avoid the topic of um, and making sure that they're able to have those conversations and, and, and bring those elements in. Um, and then uh, just the, the training about putting together a ceremony and what mm -hmm. that might look like. And for some people who don't come from a funeral service background at all, it's just learning some of the language of funeral right. service. What's the difference between a funeral service and a memorial service? Okay. Um, what are some of the, the practical natures and differences that you have to think about if it's an urn versus a casket? It's, it's really a pretty comprehensive uh, period of time. And how long of a training period is it typically? About three days. Okay. Yep. All right. And I would imagine, depending on the skill set that the person brings with them, mm -hmm. they would adopt some of that more easily. Sure. Than I think some people take the training and they're ready the very next day to go yeah. out and take over the world by storm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think some people um, uh, might sit back and feel nervous. It just depends upon the, the individual. Is uh, there online training support? Uh, there has been online training which has come out as a result of COVID-19. Okay. Um, there is online support um, through social networking with closed private groups. Okay. So um, you'll have celebrants together and uh, it's a safe place where they're able to say, you know what, this is a kind of death I've never encountered before mm -hmm. and I, I'm at a loss. Does anyone have any ideas? Has anyone seen this? Mm -hmm. um, and the some of the, you know, the, I work with Insight Institute, which does some of the training, and they have a resource manual for all their celebrants, which has hundreds of services in there. Okay. So if someone comes up and they say, I have a 37-year-old male who was married with children and died unexpectedly at work, and what do I do? Mm -hmm. Versus I have an 87-year-old woman who the family is completely in shock because she died of suicide. What mm -hmm. do I do? And there's a, a service for each, not to be copied no, and pasted, right. but as a model to mm -hmm. give ideas and to show people that it can be done. Okay. And how has social media affected your industry? I mean, you have all these, I was thinking of the different aspects, the notification of the death, the remembrances. Mm -hmm. um, do people send cards anymore? I mean, writing obits, publishing. Talk about the social media aspect of today's funeral services? You know, I, th I think uh, like every aspect of life with social media, there mm -hmm. are good elements and there are challenging elements uh, for, for people. One thing I always like to take the opportunity to remind the whole world about uh, if, 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 it, if it comes up and there's the ability to make people think is that if you've learned about the death of someone, um, you don't have to run onto Facebook immediately and share the news with the whole world. Might not be your story to tell. The, yet. the family might right. not have been able to notify other people. Okay. Uh, we've, I've seen it sometimes where someone will go on and say, I knew Billy from high school, he was a great guy, RIP, you'll be missed. And Billy's brother hasn't been able to be notified because he's been out of the country and there's okay. a time zone change. So that's kind of the be mm -hmm. careful Can get and sloppy thing. Yeah, yep. it's, it's one thing to comment on a family's mm -hmm. notification. It's another thing to make an announcement. So that's sometimes one of the harder areas. Um, but there are other areas as well where word spreads faster. Um, you know, if someone grew up in Wallingford, Connecticut, and they moved away and now they live in Phoenix, Arizona, they may check the Record Journal's website for obituaries each day. Mm -hmm. They may not. Um, but if their best friend from high school shares an obituary on social media, um, that might be a good thing because they're able to actually, mm -hmm. you know, participate in it and see it. So there's, there's good and bad in, in all, all and, aspects. And grieving. I mean, public grieving. Some people are, uh, we all have such individual differences. Some people are inclined to write mm -hmm. long things. I actually belong to a online group that is called, I think option B, it might have started with Sheryl Sandberg, but it's about people who have had loss. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how people will share very detailed experiences and maybe on the anniversary of, and you know, just um, it, such a wide variety mm -hmm. of um, comfort with being comfortable with sure. being that public. Right. And I think it also helps people realize they're not alone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll, we'll share things on social media. There may be a particular day where we, we honor a certain kind of loss. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for people then reply and comment on it, um, you know, 
I lost my son 30 years ago Mm -hmm. and it still hurts today as much as it did then Mm -hmm. and you never get over it and to have someone else then write another comment something similar for them to be able to see that other people have shared the journey and they're not alone and um, I think that's yeah this this um source that I was talking about it seems some of it's very raw for people Mm -hmm. but some people comment you know I've been there and yeah so that ability to relate to it and so how has the funeral services industry that's what i'm calling it embraced uh social media to educate people to influence sure. behaviors you know i think a different different providers to different uh different levels mm-hmm. i mean you, you have you have funeral homes out in the country that don't have a website uh, they're, okay. they're not going to be on uh on facebook doing mm-hmm. things um, our firms are a lot more proactive we're posting multiple times a week um, we're trying to provide online grief resources too. So even for our families, um, you know, for years we've we've mailed out you know little booklets after right. after a death to help people sort of understand where they might be three mm-hmm. months, six months, nine months. Um, but that online platform as well um, speaks to a new generation and to different people differently. There are some people that just they're not readers. They're not gonna just right. sit and take that book, but they might go. And if we buy them a subscription to an online grief resource for a year, they might go watch a video mm-hmm. um, or they might, you know, read something smaller or they might um, take, you know, a paragraph reflection that comes in their email box every day. Mm-hmm. Um, every loss is different and everyone grieves in their own way. That's why there, there are no true experts on grief because everyone's grief is different. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the online approach provides a variety of different ways that people could you know learn and navigate through loss so if that provides more options for more people Mm -hmm. i think it's a good thing overall and do you think the industry has influenced people with their awareness of the need for planning and thinking about i think some of it you know know, i i think um you know people see stuff online and it creates conversations and there are some people that hate it you know we will occasionally get an email saying you posted this on facebook and i don't want to think about it and yeah i'm i'm sorry uh you know we (laughs) all we could do is apologize but what i say to them is every single day i work with families that have experienced a loss and are encountering the worst day of their life. And Mm -hmm. what I have learned over nearly 20 years is that the ones that had a plan in place ahead of time were in a better position than the ones that did not. Mm -hmm. And that not everyone in in our community understands and knows that. So if we can educate the wider public Mm -hmm. and help some families be in a better position, well, I feel bad that I might get a negative email every two or three months. Yeah. Uh, overall, I know that we're helping more people and we'll continue to do it. Let's talk about some of the specifics in terms of trends. So there's the cremation versus burial. Mm-hmm. There's buy a casket at Costco. There, I mean, there's just the world, it seems like it's really changed. Yep. You know, cremation uh, has been on a steady increase for decades now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we passed the 50% mark nationally I think it was two or three years ago now. Okay. It's all it's all coming blurred together. You know, mm-hmm. if you go down in uh, Louisiana, it's it's still pretty low. You go into uh, Oregon and Washington, it's pretty high. Mm-hmm. I think that they just released the Cremation Association of North America just released some new statistics um, very recently. I think Connecticut was now at the low 60s okay. uh, for the number of people that choose cremation. Preference over now that yep. that doesn't mean that. There's not a viewing or a visitation or a mm-hmm. gathering or a wake before the cremation. Sometimes that's where you know people get misled. Um, it, it just means that when all that is done, instead of turning right to a grave at the cemetery, we turn left to the crematory and have, have mm-hmm. a cremation. Um, but definitely that is uh, what we see an increasing uh, trend towards um, and people just looking to uh, do things differently than we did 100 years ago. So. Well, I imagine... I did a little bit of research generationally. So mm-hmm. my generation might be one of the last standing that has a preference for or kind of assuming mm-hmm. it's going to be the way it used to be, maybe yep. not 100 years ago, but a couple <laughs> decades ago. And then the younger generations might be more inclined if it's they maybe barring any strong religious influence, culture sure. or whatever, um, to be thinking differently. And some of those things include... Well, I guess it would be a cremation, but you're buried under a tree with mm-hmm. a plaque, right? Yep. 
And you talked in our last session about laws and regulations that you have to study to be in your field. So I think it would be helpful to our viewers to hear what are some of the restrictions they may not be aware of regarding disposing of ashes, these ideas of turning sure. yourself in a compost. Yep. Okay. <laughs> We're not composting in Connecticut I, I yet, but I there's a. Uh, <laughs> that's a thing. That's it's a just, thing. No, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, you know, here in Connecticut, we have really two options there, there's burial and there's fire based cremation. Okay. Um, in some states, they have what is known as alkaline hydrolysis, which is a, a water uh, based cremation process. Um, where it, it essentially reproduces what happens organically and naturally, okay. but in a much Faster. more compressed time frame. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, in a number of states now, permitting that. The um, I think it's organic human reduction. The, the composting of which you referred mm -hmm. to was was legalized in Washington State. It's very new. We'll see if it catches on. I I, I don't think it will to the level that a lot of people think it will. Mm -hmm. uh, but you never know. It might. Um, we don't have that in Connecticut, but we do have an option for natural burials or green burials. So okay. that is when uh, someone passes away, there's no formaldehyde-based embalming. The body mm -hmm. is either placed in a shroud or in a completely uh, you know, green, no metal um, casket, mm -hmm. um, placed directly in the earth, not in, not in a burial vault. Uh, we currently have two cemeteries in the state um, that are active in a lot. Okay. Actually, maybe a third, I think, that might have just popped up. Um, and allowing the natural burial option. So we, we do a few of those a year. Someone can't just decide, a family member, to like take care of, do this themselves, like if someone died at home or... Connecticut is a, it is a difficult state to do a burial in your backyard. Okay, uh, I guess it, that's it, what I was trying to it say. Is, it is not <laughs> impossible. <laughs> okay. It is not impossible. Um, but uh, we had an inquiry uh, within the last year, so I did a little more research, uh, not enough to do it because ultimately they decided it wasn't worth uh, the energy or the effort. Um, but I am told it is a, a long process okay. and not necessarily a cheap one. Um, and it, it involves the local municipal regulations, involves some state regulations, mm -hmm. um, and it probably impacts the resale value of your property ultimately. But okay. <laughs> and what about transportation? I mean, I know, you know, say, People have moved, but mm -hmm. they still consider, say, Wallingford their sure. home base. There's a family plot or whatever. And then they're bringing the remains back here yep. for services and burial or... Yeah. Yeah. So we, we see that a lot for sure as well, especially in the Northeast uh, where we have a lot of people who maybe pick some of their choicest months to go somewhere mm -hmm. warmer. So. For a lot of those families, we have a we actually have a travel protection plan where um, it's a one-time fee. They buy into it, and then if the uh, person dies more than 100 miles from home, it covers all the fees associated with the airline and, and all those details okay. to get the person back. Um, if that's not in place, uh, it's not uncommon that we'll get a phone call and someone's out of state, they're North Carolina, Florida, mm -hmm. somewhere like that, um, they want to have the person brought back home. It's 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 where home is and right. always was. It's I think uh, it was Crazy Horse that said, uh, my home is where my people are buried. Okay. Um, and a lot of folks, it's really important to them. And they'll say, we always went to this church for our weddings and our funerals. Mm -hmm. You know, we always went to this funeral home. We always went to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how they navigate things. And that provides comfort, I would imagine. It yeah. feels like it's it, the natural order of things and for them, yeah, right? With their belief system absolutely. And, and their if, experiences. If it's, what, and if it's... You know, it becomes custom of how we mm -hmm. handle these things. And not to say that it doesn't get tweaked. I mean, sometimes right. someone's been out of state for 20 years, and maybe they'll say, we're going to have a service and everything there. There, and we, we see that actually it's almost the opposite. We, we have people here, and they'll say, well, I'm going to have my, my services in Connecticut, and then my burial is going to be up in Vermont or Maine. Okay. Um, and then they have the graveside service, you know, up there, and mm -hmm. they... In that case, probably aren't on an airplane because of the airport options. Right. But, you know, a hearse goes up to Vermont and mm -hmm. the family and friends who they knew from their childhood yeah. uh, have their services there. Okay. And you had talked in our last segment about some cultural preferences for returning to the homeland, like overseas. Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see a lot of people who... Um, like Eastern Europe. Or, right. Yeah. If they say, um, you know, it's where I was born, particularly if they moved here at an older age, mm -hmm. a teenager or, or beyond. Right. If, if they got married back mm -hmm. 
in Italy, in Greece, and you know, um, or even you know, one of the territories if they want to go back to Puerto Rico and they want to be able to right. be near parents or spouses. Um, you know, sometimes people move here because they lost someone and mm-hmm. the family wants to take care of them, and when the time comes, they still want to go back to their homeland. When my um, mom talked about dying, and she's like, well, I don't want a big service like your father had because I'm not from here. Well, she was born in Kansas. Mm -hmm. She'd lived here like 65 years. (laughs) I think some people would differ, but okay. But, you know, that sense of home. Right. I think I certainly can understand that. Yeah, very easily. And what about um, your role with, like, uh, donations? Do, Do they typically funnel through? Or is that an option to funnel the don- donations through, um, you know, whatever's listed in the obituary or online? Yeah. I mean, typically they go directly to the charity or the selected process. Mm-hmm. Um, and we live in an online world, so right. almost every charity, every group has a way for online donations. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, our online obituaries are, get more traffic than any other part of our website. Okay. If you, the newspapers will tell you the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, their obituary page online gets more than their news stories and all that. Mm-hmm. So on our, our tribute pages, we have it set up in such a way where if, if someone has, you know, a link to local public library, local humane society, local mm-hmm. education foundation, whatever their cause may be, the link would direct them towards there. Okay. So you there's. We don't collect the money ourselves and right. then disperse it. Okay. How about floral arrangements? Mm-hmm. I mean, typically, traditionally, there's been flowers at yeah. funerals, right? Right. And do people tend to take some of those and then donate the rest? Or do you have a role in that, I guess is what I'm saying? We can, yeah. Once the it, service it, is over. It depends on uh, family preferences. So, um, you know, sometimes if they're going to the cemetery and depending on the number of them, they're just brought for graveside and they're Mm -hmm. used to cover the grave until there's a chance to have uh you know grass planted yeah sometimes families will want to take some home uh Mm -hmm. as a memento particularly plants absolutely oh sure yeah Yeah. we work with a uh a company that will actually do freeze-dried arrangements with some of the flowers so um they started off working with brides and then they started working in the memorial field as well so they people could get a little a globe or they have the person's picture with you know, the beautiful flowers nice. around it. And they'll say this was from the casket spray. This mm-hmm. was from um, whatever. Others will dry them out. Um, and they could be turned into rosary beads for those that are Catholic. They could okay. be turned into bracelets or necklaces sometimes. And many folks have us donate them. So they'll say after the fact, if one of the local nursing homes is able to take them, mm-hmm. and then they could break them down and make floral arrangements to put in patients' rooms, mm-hmm. to put in the lunchroom, the rec room, and to right. bring some joy to others. Mm-hmm. Um, they appreciate knowing the fact that they're going to make some other folks smile. And what about specialized group like veterans? Are there certain um, service arrangements that are options for people because of their affiliation? Sure. So veterans, um, and not every veteran is always aware of the benefits mm-hmm. that are available to them, which uh, I always try to make a point just to so they're not leaving options on the table, but mm-hmm. every honorably discharged veteran is entitled to a uh, burial space for the veteran uh, and their spouse if married okay. at um, a veteran cemetery. Mm-hmm. So there's the National Veteran Cemeteries. Here in Connecticut, we have the Connecticut State Veteran Cemetery, okay. which is state-run but subsidized by the federal government. So they could get the two grave spaces for the veterans. Mm-hmm. They also get the stone, whether it's at that cemetery or private cemetery. That is uh, a benefit that's available to them. Um, if they do go to the veteran cemetery, the opening and closing of the grave, as well as the perpetual care of the grave, is covered. And then there is the honors as well for the services. Connecticut is one of the states, uh, one of the few states, where the firing party is actually subsidized by the state. It's actually okay. paid for by the state. Firing party, the plane of taps, and the folding and presentation of the flag mm-hmm. at the graveside as well. Oh, that's good to know. So for anybody that's watching, wouldn't be aware of that. And let's talk about money. Okay. So you lose someone, you're going to make the arrangements, mm-hmm. they have insurance. Yep. My understanding is they may need to bring their checkbook and credit card. Right. Right? Yeah. You know, in the old days, um, when my grandfather was around, it was just kind of sign here and right. we'll see what happens. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and as the years have gone on and, and things have changed, uh, you know, our... Funeral homes are largely small businesses as well, and our suppliers right. don't wait for uh, wait, don't wait to get paid. Mm-hmm. Uh, they all expect it promptly. So, most funeral homes have a have a payment policy where they require payment. Insurance is one thing. If people have that, they'll sometimes use. They could do an assignment on an insurance policy mm-hmm. to 
utilize that to, to pay for the funds. Um, some folks uh, plan their funerals ahead of time and set up um, a pre-need funeral agreement mm -hmm. with the funeral home in order to try to you know, take care of that ahead of time of knowing that the assets and are there save to take the care of it. from that, yeah. Absolutely. Other folks will, uh, you know, do it the old fashioned way with a check or a credit card or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be um, to make their payments. Okay. So. Yeah, I think that's important for people because you're dealing with a lot at the time and right. you may be making some assumptions. Absolutely. You know? um, and, and it's, uh, and there, there's actually, there's two ways that it could be funded ahead of time too. One is through just a standard trust account mm -hmm. and the other is, is through a final expense insurance policy. So if people come in and they say, this is what I want, and they know uh, we come up with an estimate of what it's going to cost, mm -hmm. and they have to make payments over you know three, five, ten years. Right. Um, if they get that insurance policy in place, you know, God forbid something happens and there's an accident and they mm -hmm. die before it's paid off, the protection of the insurance policy kicks in and mm -hmm. covers off the differential of the cost. Okay. So. Good to know. At break, you told me Connecticut is the only state that does not allow food and beverage at the funeral site. That's good. At the funeral home. So yeah. Home. Yep. And so that, that would have been something during the pandemic that, as you were saying, could have helped some of the supporting industries that could have helped them stay afloat maybe a little bit with just yeah. providing that. So there's some effort to get that law changed and join the rest of <laughs> the, the world, country. The country, yeah. You know, there's a, there's a bill in the legislature currently. Um, we're getting to the end of the session. So uh, whether it, it passes or not, we'll see. But, you know, death and eating are one of those things that go hand in hand. I mean, people bring a ham to someone's house, they bake cookies, um, it's what we do. They, And we live in a society that people travel a lot mm -hmm. and we're not all living in the same town anymore. So, you know, the cousins who drove in from New Jersey uh, three hours and sat an extra hour in traffic and right. then the family wants to be able to offer them a cup of coffee in a Danish or something yeah. like that. In 49 other states, that's pretty common. Uh, yeah. you, you, you go into the wake at the funeral home and they might have a cookie tray out, they mm -hmm. might have a coffee urn. Um, and as people who don't see each other very often are able to reconnect as family, as friends and mm -hmm. gather, um, you know, and, and be able to break bread and share a cup of coffee, uh, it's pretty common and normal in, okay. in that part of every other state uh, okay. here in Connecticut. We're, uh, we could so offer you oh, some water. <laughs> hard candy. I think hard candy is allowed, isn't it? Oh, no, no, okay. <laughs> Bending the rules. We have right. it, but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, again, thank you, Matthew. I think you really provided a great service to our viewers to have information about very important topics and things they might not be aware of, so informing them, inspiring them to do a little maybe thinking ahead. Yeah. And I appreciate so much you being a guest. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Again, George Ann Lewis here, the host for today's session with Local Lens. Thank you for watching. Matthew Bailey is a certified funeral services practitioner. 